I actually held a public forum for my regard to development, had a sense of the community, and also then made a submission after that information request was received from the applicant and the updated plan so that I could give the most current um, submission. That was uh, given to the planning department on the 28th of July with addendum on the 1st of August, which uh, I believe at that time it was supposed to be, the report was supposed to be handed down on the 30th of August and it was going to be referred to the September round of council meetings. However, a few days after my submission, council requested an extension of the application on the 4th of August, which went to the 20th of October. And then two days before that, on the 18th of October, the applicant sought the decision-making process. Uh, sometime, I can't work out exactly when in there, uh, the applicant actually submitted revised plans for 16 units and 15 units, but it's my understanding that they weren't included in the um, assessment because no formal change to the application was made. Um, and so it had to be assessed on 20 units. Basically, um, yeah, on the 23rd of December, it was rejected for those range of reasons that you uh, mentioned. So basically, I wanted to discuss today issues with not only the co-assessment process, but issues that will not will reply to future applications. Um, there's no point in getting bogged down in all the other uh, contraventions that are specific to that has been rejected. But there will be things that follow on, uh, particularly the biodiversity significance of the lot. Um, it's quite detailed. A lot of, a lot of um, issues here, like Queensland State Planning Policy talks about the biodiversity state interest, um, and it requires the state uh, sustainable long-term development of biodiversity is supported. Significant impacts on matters of national or state environmental significance, which this lot has both. Uh, are, are avoided, uh, which they won't. Um, where this cannot be reasonably achieved, impacts are minimised or residual impacts offset, which I don't believe that occurred either. Specifically, we have matters of state environmental significance, uh, categorisation category R, endangered regional ecosystem, which is 93.3% of the site. Um, MSES, so matters of state environmental significance, regular vegetation intersecting with workhorse. There's three workhorses or waterways identified on the biodiversity overlay map for the local. And the Queensland Department of Environment and Science Aquatic Biodiversity Assessment and method, uh, Mapping Method, which is the AquaBAM, which talks about riverland wetlands. It uh, breaks down the aquatic nature and it actually, 100% of the site is classed very high conservation significance for riverland wetlands. And it further breaks it down and talks about the percentage of the site. 100% uh, of the site, natural aquaticness, 100% of the site for diversity and richness, very high rating for threatened species and eco uh, ecosystems, 100% of the site. Priority species and ecosystems, 100% of the site, very high. And special features, 100%. And it was, so it's got quite high biodiversity in, in uh, regards to wetlands and riverland wetlands. Um, and then we also have <coughs> EPBC Act identified threatened ecological communities, which include Coastal swamp, sclerophyll forest of New South Wales and South East Queensland, which is endangered, and lowland rainforest of subtropical Australia, which is critically endangered. On top of that, we have um, at least 221 known fauna and flora species uh, within the area of interest in the one kilometre buffer, and that's under wild net species list, which includes at least 14 conservation significant species under the Nature Conservation Act, and that's important because it will apply to ecologically important areas under the planning scheme. Um, also, on top of that, we have 51 threatened species and 15 migratory species potentially occurring within the site of a five kilometre buffer area, and that is under the EPBC Act. And that's also relevant to the ecologically important areas under the planning scheme as well. Um, we keep going on by biodiversity for so long, but I, I won't. There's other areas like koala habitat, uh, koala priority areas, sorry, and um, the local biodiversity overlay. Um, what was not identified in the original information request was the setback. Uh, there's only overlay, there's a 10 metre setback prohibition from development and clearing of vegetation within 10 metres of the centre line of waterways identified on the lot, and there's three of those. And so I would have thought it would have been identified right at the beginning back in March, but it wasn't. It was identified as um, encroachment on the Riparian zone, but that was not the only issue there. I believe that this was a glaring 
um, contravention of that biodiversity overlay, which should have been identified. And I identified in my submission, and I thought there might have been an information request following my submission, but there wasn't as well. But I was pleased to see that in the final rejection letter, it was noted that the setback wasn't met. Um, but I want to bring it up because it's going to have to be uh, applied adequately to future applications. Um, particularly, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, four, possibly fifteen native species within those that ten metre uh, setback, which need to be protected. So it actually precludes development and clearing for most of the section of the front of the block. But I'm sure, the block would be good. But um, those revised plans for 16 and 15 units still had units in that front area, so they're still not regarding that um, those areas. And then on top of that, beyond the overlay, I believe that there's a big tree there, Eucalyptus pilularis, 22 metres, which should be classed as a koala habitat tree under the planning scheme, um, which wasn't identified either. Um, under the planning scheme, it has to mean two food tree uh, under uh, so it means eucalyptus genera and a preferred shelter species, which from my research it is. I found a report from the Australian University to the Department of Environment, uh, Agricultural Water and Environment, and they identified it as an auxiliary habitat tree. So it should be protected on those grounds as well. But it's marked for clearing and development. Um, so beyond that, the, there was encroachment on the riparian zone, which was identified. Um, and then that moves me on to the need to regard the entire lot as an ecologically important area, which I don't believe it, it, was, it was in the final rejection. Um, why does it need to be the whole lot be an ecologically important area? Because I believe it meets nine of the planning scheme definitions for it. Um, some of the one, most interesting ones are A, an area which contains or is likely to contain listed threatened species or ecological communities, which it did, I went over at the start. A listed migratory species, which does, as defined by the EBPCA, which I said at the start, and also in danger of, uh, of concerned regional ecosystems under the Management Act, which it does. And this is the majority of the site, not just those areas of the waterways. And finally, the um, likely habitat for endangered, vulnerable, or new threatened species under the Nature Conservation Act. So it hits all of those, plus seven other ones, which I won't bother going through, but they're there. And so I wanted to really highlight that to ensure that future applications regard the entire lot because there's multiple areas in the planning scheme that talk about ecologically important areas and it basically adds more codes that need to be satisfied and they weren't identified and I believe they should like for example medium density residential zone code um, performance outcome 12 G protects the natural character and avoid adverse impacts on ecologically important areas such as national parks and waterways and wetlands even in the hinterland villages overlay code um, or the code says it should uh, site be designed to protect ecologically important areas. There's a couple in there, talking about changes to natural drainage, changes to fauna, habitat, and behavior. So if that's adequately applied, um, there'll be more, more uh, it'd be harder for, to uh, apply a large scale development to this plot. Um, Furthermore, I identified issues with the site coverage uh, of the lot, of the development, sorry. The applicant identified as 32%, but I don't believe it's correct because of definitions of site cover and site. So the site, the definition of the planning scheme of site cover is the portion of the site expresses a percentage that will be covered by a building structure, blah, 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 but it says the portion of the site. So what's the site? Well, the site is the land that the development is to be carried out on not necessarily the lot, but the land it's to be carried out on. And they give an example, if development is to be carried on part of that lot, which this is, the site is that part of the lot. So not the entire seven, or what is it, uh, 0.75 hectares. I, I believe in creating that 32% percentage, they've included that whole area where they should actually remove the whole riparian zone and anything south of that because, and they should also remove any areas regarding the protected waterway. And by doing that, it actually pushes up the site coverage. Uh, I don't know exactly because I don't know the exact uh, square meterage of those the riparian area and stuff, but um, I do know that there's a 40% maximum allowable site coverage, and they're at 32%. And so you remove all of that, um, it is potentially over 40%. That wasn't identified, um, and it probably should be, and it needs to be in future applications because already in those revised plans for 15 and 16 units, 
they've given, I think it's 28 percent site coverage, but again, they've used the exact same calculation, so I believe it's incorrect. Um, okay, so about 11 minutes. Um, I thought I'd quickly talk about the Kingsland Villages Code, the character and identity, in particular Pomona. Pomona has no medium density housing complexes of this scale and intensity, and the proposed development would not be in line with the existing build form character and identity of the town, which I believe was actually recognised in the final um, refusal. Um, the development footprint was not minimised, which would not only result in net loss of ecologically important areas, but negatively impact the character and identity of the town, including the established vegetated character of the neighbourhood. And the code says the development within each village must be consistent with the identified character and that of a particular community. It must retain and enhance the small scale rural character and natural environment values. Be consistent with the traditional build form of low rise and low density buildings and be protected, uh, protect the ecologically important areas. So there's the ecologically important area yet again. Um, they also must retain heritage character and the identity of the small country town and be sympathetic to buildings that contribute to the character of the village and the landscape setting. Um, so the other overlays on it were flood, landslide, bushfire. There were issues with some of the units with bushfire being close to severe threat vegetation. Um, Medium density residential so, uh, code, local villages code, dual occupancy, multiple dwelling code, and works code. So lots of codes on it. Um, and I had gone into it in detail uh, with multiple contraventions of it, but it's not worth raising now, but I will raise them in, in for future applications when they come before the council um, and possibly do a deputation on that one as well, because I'm sure there'll be more applications on this lot. Um, lastly, I wanted to quickly address potential undisclosed conflicts of interest uh, regarding the applicant. Um, I raised this in my submission to the planning department uh, as when I held that public forum back in April the planning, uh, the applicant or town planner came and addressed the community, introduced herself and her partner as uh, herself was the principal town planner and her partner was the environmental scientist who did the ecological assessment. That was never disclosed, uh, that person, potential personal relationship in the uh, any of the reports. And uh, the report author would, appears to be related to, the, to them. So, I believe that council should be investigating that to the fullest extent before relying on any information provided by them. And I actually believe that that would be required under the Public Sector Ethics Act, uh, particularly regarding integrity, objectivity, impartiality, and transparency of the assessment. So that will also apply to future applications from this applicant. And then finally, just to summarise what I basically wanted to see out of this deputation and any future applications would be for the council to overall recognise the uh, extent of the biodiversity values of the lot, which I've gone over. For council to recognise the entire lot as an ecologically important area and apply the requirements therein of the planning scheme, uh, particularly minimisation impacts the scale and, and the clearing. And I actually didn't talk about the verge clearing, but there's a lot of uh, native vegetation on the verge, which was updated later on, uh, wasn't in the original application, uh, which are uh, within that 10 metre setback because the waterways actually extend onto the street. Uh, council to recognise the 22 metre eucalyptus pillar as a wild habitat tree. Council to ensure adequate application of the planning scheme into the future for future applications, especially that biodiversity overlay. Council to conduct a review of this code assessment and require oversight of future applications for the lot, considering the pitfalls with this current Code assessment. Uh, council to ensure accurate calculation of the site coverage percentage for future applications. And council to adequately investigate potential conflicts of interest regarding the applicant. So that's pretty much my time now. So in conclusion, I'd just like to thank everyone for listening to me and, and uh, thank the CEO as well for approving my deputation and the mayor's assistant for uh, organising it. And uh, the planning department as well for actually ultimately rejecting the inappropriate development. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would you be able to provide an electronic copy of your deputation so we can have regard to those issues? I can. It won't be word for word, does it? That's all right. And also, you did make some unconfirmed um, statements about undeclared conflicts of interest. Mm -hmm. Could you be put that in writing so that can be investigated, please? Rather than just leaving it so hanging out there and up in the public. Place. It has been put in right. Uh, my submission was actually sent to the planning department and all councillors. Yeah. So it has With been. With the names? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, thank you.
Yeah. Is that something you could clarify? I don't know, Patrick. Well, in specific about the conflict of interest? Yes. Well, they're professional. And so who, uh, who are, they, are they the... So we've got a planning consultant. The applicant and, and, uh, and her husband is the ecologist. So they have to be married and they submitted their own reports. And, uh, on behalf of the applicant? On behalf of the applicant. So they're not the council employees? They've got nothing to do with council. Okay. So, so yeah. the assessment of those reports is undertaken by council yeah. officers and associated yeah. experts. I'm, my mistake, I thought you were referring a link between a council employee and an applicant's yeah. consultant. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for taking the time. <coughs> yeah. Okay. We now go to the uh, reports director general committee, which first item is planning applications decided by a delegated authority. The report November 2022. Um, I think it's still for me and I'm here with one of the committees from the guy that I just fed in, the delegated authority report due to my close personal relationship with applicants Jane and Cameron Black. As a result of my conflict of interest, I will leave the meeting room on the night it's considered and vote on. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Councillor Lawrence. Um, I'm Councillor Lawrence and the meeting that I had a terrible conflict of interest in regards to item 11 of the delegated authority report due to my personal relationship with the applicants Mark Bain and Bain family who are family friends. We've attended social events together and our children have attended school together. As a result of my conflict of interest, I will leave the meeting room while the matter is considered and voted upon. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Councillors, some can move the motion. Councillor Stockwell, seconded Councillor Jerusalem. Um, I just had a, a general question for Patrick. Patrick, in a lot of the, um, the items that we discussed this earlier, um, there are issues raised, um, for example, setbacks to boundaries and waterway, biodiversity and landslide, height, boundary setbacks. They often refer to relaxations granted. Could you just talk yeah. to the okay. scale and significance of those? So those? when we have an application for a new dwelling that comes before council, it's it's seeking variation to a planning scheme requirement. Now it's possible for someone to construct a dwelling without, you know, in, in the low density residential zone and the medium density residential zone and the high density residential zones without coming to council. They've got acceptable outcomes that if they comply with, they can move straight forward in the path to getting a certification and, and construct their dwelling. So what you see what you see on the report are those applications, the percentage, you know, might be, a, I'm not, I couldn't actually give you the percentage of total dwellings and what we approve, but it's not all the dwellings that get constructed within the, within the Shire come through planning. So, so they come to us with the, uh, variations that are proposed and that's what you see on this list um, and what you see on the list is what's been applied for so if we didn't approve the height but we approved the setback you would actually still going to see height and setback on this list so I think going forward it's identified that what we need to do is at the back end of the system update when we approve if it's different to what's been applied for and then what comes through on the report is actually reflective of that yeah. Having said that, I think it's likely that what you see on the report is actually reflective of what was approved. And and sometimes you'll see height, setback, site cover, but the variations might be quite minor. It might be 8.1 metres. It might be 1.9 or 1.8 metre setback as opposed to 2 metres. And now the new scheme talks about, with setbacks, outermost projection. So it picks up eaves, whereas the old scheme didn't include eaves. So you might have some instances where the setback might only relate to eaves. Um, so, you know, these are all these variations are uh, scrutinised when there's an application for them and, and when they're approved, we're confident that it's suitable to approve them. Um, similarly, when you're looking at um, landslide or biodiversity, it's reflective of, of our scheme in terms of the scheme calls up for approval for any um, development within the uh, moderate and high landslide areas. The previous scheme actually had a, a provision within it that said if there's a geotechnical report that's been provided, so long as the certifier includes those recommendations in their approval, that part of the scheme wouldn't trigger. Um, we've generally been doing exemption certificates where landslide is the only um, trigger on the basis that there is a geotechnical report that is provided to us with recommendations. 
Um, but where there's more than one trigger, landslide and something else, we'll bring it in. And in terms of biodiversity, you'll find that there are some lots within the Shire which are completely vegetated and the biodiversity overlay applies to the whole site. And it's reasonable for there to be a, a dwelling constructed on, on, on these lots, um, if they're rural residential lots and, and the like. And, and when we're doing our assessment, we're looking to make sure that the extent of vegetation removal is, is minimised and, and to some degree the regulations around koala protection um, give some real guidance around that, ensuring that the, um, the exemptions that are allowed under, un, allowed under that regulation are the limit of what's approved. But you often have bushfire is going to be another implication when you've got a biodiversity overlay that the, the dwelling needs to have a defendable space around it. So, Thank you. So hopefully. perhaps more detail about well, well, I think, exemptions I think in, in, in terms of what's actually approved, in terms of what's different, what, when it's different to what's been applied for, we can clarify that better in this report going forward. So just to clarify that, within what we, what we see here is essentially what would be minor, minor that, issues, so anything more major than that would come before council? Well, we haven't been bringing dwellings to council. Um, the dwellings that have been coming to council are those, for example, along Seaview Terrace, where the geotechnical... Like more major, more major concerns. That's correct. That's correct. Any other questions or comments for staff? Uh, I will close. Right. Um, I think it's time to review why these things come to a council meeting. At the time we did it, there was a lack of understanding of what was happening in the organisation. Quite often they take a long time just through conflicts of interest. I think the matters dealt with that up below. What a council should get involved with largely, I think it'd be much better just to have it as a regular email, just like we get for what applications have been received, because I don't think it's uh, the matters are of such significance that it warrants uh, debate in the council meeting. Put the motion to the vote. Those in favour? Oh, I've got one. Well, no, 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 Okay, item two, representative. Item two is representation to the decision notice the dwelling house at 66 Seaview Terrace, Sunshine Beach. Um, Patrick, your item again, that's the first Council Lawrence has got a question. I cancel Lawrence and inform the media that I have a terrible conflict of interest in this matter. It's Deborah, Deborah Reed, a submitter to the application, is a personal friend. Although I have a declarable conflict of interest, I do not believe a reasonable person could have a perception of bias because I believe I do not have a close personal relationship with Miss Reed. Therefore, I will choose to remain in the room. However, I will respect the decision of the meeting on whether I can remain and participate in the decision. Councillors, just, just a question. So it raises the question that. The, the Act specifies the level of the relationship and they call it close personal relationship. What you're declaring is you don't believe that you have something that's triggered by the Act. It's not to that extent. The fact of doing it as a courtesy. That's an interesting one. You declare confidence with your saying. Um, um, the the um, just um, in light of recent events, I'm just exercising abundance of caution. So, yeah. so just a question. Uh, it seems paradoxical on one, one level saying Kev is a personal friend because you don't have a, a close personal relationship. With yeah. So that would raise me to raise the question is can you outline the nature of the relationship? as a personal friend as opposed to a close personal relationship? Um, I know uh, Deborah, our children attended the same school um, and I know her to speak on the beach and say hello um, and have a discussion with her. Um, I've never been inside her house um, with attended social events through school um, but I'm friendly with her as I am with a lot of parents that my children um, attend school with. And she's um, a submitter to the application. Again, exercising abundance of caution, I wouldn't necessarily have made the submission otherwise. I'm going to move to the I'll send it. Can I stop off? Okay. Put it away, that's 
carried unanimously. Patrick, could you give us an overview of the yep. latest application? Okay. So, um, councillors may recall some time ago this application was. Um, well, the application for the dwelling was reported to council, um, at which time it was approved. Um, there was a condition uh, requiring the deletion of the rooftop terrace. Uh, there were some concerns that were raised in terms of overlooking and the, and the bulk attributed to the rooftop terrace. So um, the applicant has now made representations where they're seeking to have condition for deleted and have submitted amended plans um, which amend the form of the rooftop deck. Um, you may also recall that a um, scaffold was erected on this site um, to give some guidance to myself and to to the um, the designer and the, the planning consultant as to the extent of overlooking that was arising from the previously approved plans. And it was quite evident at that time that overlooking was an issue. Um, they have gone away and amended the plans, as I said. Um, the plans have managed to deal with the overlooking by addressing the setback of the rooftop terrace and the extent of screening. However, there are concerns with the form of the rooftop terrace in terms of its impact upon the streetscape, the surrounding properties and, and the impact that it will have on some view lines. Um, so it's recommended that the application be refused. Um, my recommendation, I have erroneously incorporated the Coastal Communities Local Plan Code into the grounds of refusal, and there's a comment in there in the report about some provisions. That actually is not relevant in this case. It's not a code that is applicable to the assessment of this application, so I apologise for that. I've also sought to in improve or, or the ground of refusal in relation to the low density residential zone code um, because the rooftop terrace will have an impact on the view lines of premises on the other side of um, sea view terrace and surrounding properties and so I've included that in the grounds of refusal as well. Um, now throughout the process or towards the end of the process um, the applicant has seen the report they've identified that the plans that I provided to you included one render they they sought that all of the renders that were provided in relation to the streetscape be provided to you and I did that on Friday last week I sent an email to councillors with that information they've also um, identified some properties um, that they consider warrant justification of the rooftop terrace in terms of the streetscape and I've been through those and I have prepared a, um, a little addendum, um, Cathy, if, if it's okay to go to that at this point. Um, so the properties so commence with 46 Seaview Terrace and what I've, what I've got before you is um, just a comment in italics that was uh, taken from the planner's report at that time. That was an application that was made in 2005. Um, and it notes that a small portion of the southwestern corner of the proposed garage and upper level balcony is located within the six metre front setback. Um, it's considered that the minor intrusion of 0.7 of a metre is acceptable, given the topography of the site and the location of the existing carport. Now that plan there is the ground floor plan, and you'll see that dotted line that's running parallel to the front boundary. That's the six metre setback, and you'll see that minor intrusion there on the right hand side, that's in relation to the ground floor. And if you go to the next page, you'll see there again, there's just a very minor intrusion on the upper level. So again, that's a six metre line with that very minor intrusion. The scenario we've got in the current application is that the built form um, is at 3.5 metres from the front boundary. So it's much, much closer and it's for, uh, for a considerable expanse as compared to, to this development. If you could please go to the next page, um, 50 C view terrace, uh, this is a plan of the upper level. Um, you'll see the six metre line to the corner of the bathroom and also to the guest room. It's showing that the building at the upper level is set back six metres. Um, the report made reference to a beam at 4.6 metres. Having a look at the plans, it was quite difficult to determine where that beam was, um, but it also did appear that there was a bit of a roof overhang into the setback. Again, nothing to the extent that we're talking about in terms of the current application. And um, if you could please, Cathy, go to the next page. So this is 54 Seaview Terrace. Um, now, 
this design is one where, if I could just stand up, the, the front wall of the building is actually back at six metres. This is just a, a measuring tool so they can know the area. So that's six metres where the front wall of the building is. And then there's like a, a wrap that just goes like a, a re beam overhang and then down the size of the building. And that's what extends into the six metres. So um, that's I think about 1.2 metres, I think it says, into the into the setback. So again, the building, the face of the building's at six metres. And then you've got these lighter elements that protrude 1.2 metres into the setback. So again, significantly less dominant than what is proposed in the current application. Questions? I'm going to have a couple of questions. So you mentioned that the scaffolding was erected to try and assess the request for, to vary the conditions of approval. Um, how? The scaffold was erected, is that uh, sort of the top of the scaffolding, was that equivalent to roof height, deck height, what was that equivalent to? Yeah, so the, the, so the, the same, the floor level of the, um, of the deck, the, which is the roof of the, of the dwelling. Yeah. And um, there was some um, material, some board that was placed up to reflect what would be um, the screening that was proposed uh, and that Obviously, took it up higher, but the, the the base of the scaffold was the the roof level. So that's the images we're seeing on page twenty nine of the report in two and three. That's correct. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> I'm happy to move to the amended recommendation as occurs on the screen there. Uh, so the people who are listening, watching, um, that deletes um, item one in the the published recommendation and adds an item D into what is now the new item one to read will obstruct the views of building of dwellings maybe yeah. within proximity of the site. Yeah. Yeah, second to that, please. Councillor Lawrence, Councillor Stockwell. Uh, I do so, as councillors may recall, I actually thought there's sufficient um, breaches of performance outcomes of the original development to refuse this uh, whole development. I still believe that to be the case. And uh, when you look at the picture on uh, page 29 of that scaffolding, uh, recognising that the provisions related to cantilevered awnings will have actually built in rooms to that height, um, I think is. The, clearly there will be already be an impact in terms of the scenic amenity and overlooking. I think making that worse by putting a rooftop terrace on is unconscionable. Okay. Councillors councillors wish to speak to the motion? Just, just a question. Um, Tom? With, with, uh, on top of the rooftop terrace, would there be a possibility of putting up umbrellas and things, therefore even going higher? Well, the, the rooftop terrace does, it, it has a roof on it um, at the moment. Um, and yes, they certainly could put uh, umbrellas in other areas of, of the roof, which I suppose I don't think would be probably higher than the roof that's proposed, but it would extend areas of visual intrusion and, and potential view line blockages. Mm. Okay, so we speak to the motion for Councillor Stockwell closes. Right, closed. Put the motion as in favour. Carried. That is correct. Um, so this is an application under the short stay uh, local law. Um, at, an approval was issued uh, for this application and standard conditions were applied. Um, subsequent to, to that approval being issued, the officer realised that the building approval had actually lapsed for the development, so it meant that it was actually in contravention of the requirements for the 
the areas or the dwelling to have the appropriate approvals in place and then they issued a refusal notice um, this application that the um, applicants made to go to the court is against the conditions of the approval um, they've also sought for the refusal to be reviewed and their position is that council wasn't able to issue a refusal after issuing an approval and that there was a process that should have been gone through in terms of a show cause notice that it had been issued. Um, through engaging our legal representatives to represent us in the appeal uh, or to put them on notice, they've given advice around the review to advise that the applicant is correct, that we, we didn't have the capacity to just issue a refusal, that there would have been, a, there is a process that we need to go through from the approval in terms of a show cause notice. So we're going to follow that process through, um, but notwithstanding this appeal around the conditions of the original approval still stands. And um, as you read by the report, it recommends that it's in order for council to defend that appeal. This is the first type of appeal we've had against approval conditions as well. Question, if approval is given to a dwelling, how can it lapse? A building approval, it was. So um, the building approval was issued and the works were carried out whilst the approval was current. And then the final sign off didn't occur until and the, the approval had lapsed and then the certified disengaged themselves from the process. So, so typically it, it's an unapproved building. Unapproved building. So they would need to go back through a certifier to get approval for the works, and it's and it, it may be the case that they can Which obtain. They can yeah. yeah. So on that basis, what was the time frame of the application being made, the works being undertaken, and the, 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 uh, the lapse occurred? I think it was four years off the top of my head, Joe. So the it, approval was back in? 2013, 2014. So, just to clarify, uh, the reason why the building approval is relevant or the, the failure to get a final certificate to say it's built in accordance with the approval is because this uh, establishment was operating under an exhaust, it was seeking to operate under an existing lawful use right provision, is that right? That's correct. Yeah, so have, not having a final building certificate means they didn't have a lawful use because you shouldn't be lawfully using the house. That's correct. Okay. That's right. Okay, fair enough. As motion us, councillors, some can move it. Councillor Stewart. Second, Councillor Lawrenson. Councillor Stewart is to speak to the motion. The councillors wish to speak to the motion. Motion is in favour. That's unanimous. <coughs> Next item four, representation to development permit for material changes. This is the short term accommodation at 401 Sunrise Road in Viewer. Data. Hello. Oh, hello. Data. Share your sir. Please, yeah, absolutely. Um, so a report for this application was presented to council, <coughs> pardon me, sorry, um, at the general committee meeting in October 2022 um, regarding change representations made to the original development approval for a material change of use for short term accommodation. Um, the applicant has made change representations to four conditions of the decision notice um, around the total number of guests that can be accommodated, um, the use times of outdoor areas, um, the ceiling of the shared access driveway, and then, <coughs> pardon, sorry me. <coughs> I'm sorry, I have a little bit of a cough at the moment. <laughs> um, and then providing a potable water supply. Um, the applicant um, stopped the decision making period after the general committee meeting um, to further discuss um, issues around the ceiling of the driveway um, with uh, council staff and then the decision period has been extended out until the 19th of January. Um, the rec it's recommend sorry <coughs> Pardon me, sorry. Um, it's recommended that conditions 5 and 15 be amended generally as requested by the applicant um, regarding the total number of guests that can be accommodated um, and the provision of a potable water supply. 
um, it's recommended that condition 12 regarding the ceiling of the driveway be amended to include the ceiling of the crossover from Sunrise Road to the existing unsealed portion of the shared access driveway. And then it's recommended that condition six, sorry, uh, not be supported. <coughs> so, um, so we, we didn't vote on this. So this is the actual, the fight that, because we argued up and down, but then it was, yeah, then it was pulled off. That's right. right. Yep. Yeah. So we didn't finish voting on it. So this is the actual. That's right. And, and you may recall at the time, there was a query <coughs> around the number of car spaces yeah. that were available. And you'll find in, in the report that Jada has assessed, uh, <coughs> assessed that component and determined that there's significant areas around the dwelling also capable of accommodating car parking as well as the garage. And so the applicant has to seal the road? The, the that's correct. So from the, from the crossover through to the existing sealed portion of the driveway, which I think is a, a distance of 34 metres, um, is required to be sealed. To clarify, there seems to be the same amount of water provided. Just a different yes, configuration. The, um, yes, so um, it's just a condition of the, the decision notice that um, a potable water supply is provided um, and the applicant has uh, just asked for, um, I guess, some different wording around that condition, which um, we agree to. And can you clarify the discrepancy between the, the eight um, guests and, and ten the approved plans were for five bedrooms. Correct. The minimum of two per bedroom. Uh, four, four bedrooms. Four bedrooms. Approved by yeah. yeah, it was four bedrooms, and the plans showed um, bunks in one of the rooms. So the, it showed ten beds on the approval, okay. and um, so that's what they're seeking. <coughs> and it was conditioned for eight, yes. and they're seeking that it be allowed to be ten because they're saying it's consistent with what was shown on the plans. Um, but notwithstanding, um, I think the re report picks up that the scheme does allow for five bedrooms in the low density residential zone to be used for short term accommodation. So I think using that as a litmus test, uh, Could you say that again, please, the the low density residential zone has a provision that for short term accommodation, the, ex the amount of bedrooms be limited to five. Yes. Now this is in the rural residential zone, so we're on a more expansive property, generally a, a, a larger home. Yes. Um, so five bedrooms would generally equate to 10 people in the low density residential zone. So our thinking is it's reasonable for 10 people to also be accommodated on this site. And you also disagree with your request to strike out the condition that prevented them from using the outside areas after 9 p.m.? So they can't use the outside areas after 9 p.m.? That's correct. So impact on neighbours? That's correct. But when the, when the owners are staying there, that's okay? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask, so the room 30, thank you. Um, with the 10 people must not exceed, so we potentially in, in this property, if it is short term accommodation, it could potentially be five lots of five couples. That's correct. Yeah. And with five, with five cars. That's correct. And there's sufficient room on site to accommodate those five yeah. cars. Yeah. Joe, my question relates around the 10 versus 8 with regard to the number of people. That fourth bedroom has bunks. Is there a, a provision to? or capacity to provide a condition that it must be, must contain four bunks so that the ten are contained within the four bedrooms and it doesn't because otherwise how do we how do we ensure that it's it's being occupied in the manner to which it was approved? Well the, the limit of ten people would if would ten people doesn't mean they stay in the four bedrooms and the, the way the, the, the way the property is being approved is four bedrooms with with capacity for sleeping ten within those four bedrooms, by outside those four bedrooms. You put a requirement in, I'll be sleeping in the lounge room. <laughs> and that's all the lines I want to look Well, you, are you worried that more than ten people may inhabit the premise? Potentially. Well, I would have thought the condition for the ten people is sufficient to, to prevent that. Yeah, I was, we would, you know, the, the discussion originally was delivered to wait because of the four bedrooms. Yeah. Okay, the... Um, what's being what's being um, uh, allowed here or, or provided for here is the fact that there are that the fourth bedroom showed bunks, which means or two of the bedrooms showed bunks, so that there's capacity for one would think children and a, and a family group as opposed to ten adults. So how do we um, 
provision that um, that, that bunks are the, uh, the, the bed, bedding feature in that uh, in that additional in those those last two bedrooms to ensure that the capacity remains at ten within the bedroom. Um. I'm, I might be pulling, I might be clutching the straw here, but I'm just trying to. If that was what was approved, with drawings, the bunks were there, then one would think that that's the where the um, um, sleeping accommodation is uh, is provided, and that's the type of bedding that's re that, that's required to be provided for approval. Well, perhaps condition five, if councillors were agreeable, could be amended to read the number of guests accommodated and the associated number of beds at any one time must not exceed ten. We're not going to go into the working out of the business. I might be clutching a straw, so I'm trying to see how the approval uh, aligns with the, um, the, the application of the, the, the plans that were submitted. Mm. I, I think if, if they had one double bed and then eight children in bunks or four people in double beds and six people in bunks, we wouldn't be concerned as long as the number didn't exceed well, 10. Yeah, just a question. The applicant has raised a uh, suggested there is a similar case where uh, we've allowed MPM and they signed a, an application. Just a question do we have a consistent process of determining what the operating hours are? I seem to recall that previously it was in, we used nine for pool areas and urban areas, but I'm just wondering is there a consistent approach we've adopted and that justifies yeah. this? Well, the, the, the matter that the applicant refers to is actually in the rural zone. And um, so we have been consistent in applying the 9 p.m. to areas outside the rural zones okay. and being open to 10 p.m. in the rural zones as long as sufficient separation is provided. And we did have an application, sorry, that, that came before council, the, the first application in the rural zone. And it was at that time that we decided that 10 p.m. was reasonable on that side. That was the one in Kinky. Yeah, yeah, Pomona or Kinkin, yeah. Joe, my recollection also is that we had some discussion around the minimum size allotment being four hectares where short term accommodation was allowed in the rural residential zone. This one's under four hectares. So. It, it's a trigger within the scheme as the type of assessment that's required. So where it's under four hectares, it goes to impact assessment and four hectares and above. So that, that's, that, that would be in support. I, I would suggest support some. Uh, ha having more of an urban consideration than a rural consideration. I think so, yes. Thank you. I'm going to before the council, Larson. Oh, just a quick question. Um, we're in a housing crisis and um, there are issues of housing supply. My question, Patrick, is um, previous applications for short term accommodation have been not approved on that basis. Why is this one different? Um, the areas where we've got um, a high percentage of short-term accommodation occurring along the coastal areas, I think we're 20, up above 27%. We've certainly identified the housing prices have been quite significant. I, I, I take the point, this is take, potentially taking a house at time away from full-time occupation, uh, notwithstanding, I think, is a percentage, the provision of rural accommodations and rural dwellings it's quite a, a very, at this stage, a very, very small percentage that are being used for short-term short accommodation. So. Is there a danger then by approving this application that there's the potential to open the floodgates for further STA applications in the hinterland region? Well, with the, the I mean, with the scheme at the moment, it certainly, um, it does encourage, it doesn't have the predominant um, permanent residential component to it when you're talking about the rural areas those provisions won't they apply in those more uh, urban areas so the, at the moment the scheme actually doesn't say that the rural areas should be predominantly residential so that was a key reason why we've refused short-term accommodation in um, the high density residential zones and the medium density residential zones um, so at the moment, with it being consistent use and not having that provision, there certainly is the capacity for future applications to be made that would be consistent with the scheme. Um, again, if councillors were mindful or, or of the opinion that they that was that was an issue in terms of housing supplies, there's an opportunity through planning scheme amendments to, to change to change that. Um, in terms of approving maximum number of residents to ten people. 
um, want to be continual, but the main issue with this two days, one of the, one of the many issues with this two days is the issue of noise mm -hmm. and party houses. Um, I took out the Planning Act 2016, Section 276, to get my head around the definition of party houses. Um, and I don't think the definition is wide enough or... Uh, my question is, by approving 10 people in a home, um, are we in fact approving a party house? Um, the potential of having one or more families or 10 adults um, to me is concern and are we failing to mitigate the misuse of an STA property? Was that part of your consideration when approving 10 residents? I'll certainly look, um, but note that these properties are quite large um, and that there is some meaningful separation between the dwelling and surrounding dwellings. Um, but a party house, it could be three bedrooms with, with six people in it, or I don't think the number of people on site necessarily determines whether it's going to be a party house or not. Certainly it facilitates more people being there, but it comes down to, I think, how people are going to behave. And, 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 you know, if a party house, if they're going to invite other friends over and the like. So, I mean, that's something I think we need to to regulate separately. Excuse me, Patrick, won't this house be subject to the local law? And it also will be subject to the local law. That's right, it'll need to get a local law. That, impacts from that's correct. Yep. As well as the conditions on the approval. Yep. Patrick, I have a question. Uh, you just said that, thank, thank you, Frank. Um, you just said that there's a small amount being used in hinterland, you know, unlike what we see in our coastal regions, and that's certainly a consideration. Um, we're seeing you know, far more proliferation of STAs along the eastern beaches mm. and in our more in city suburbs or in, 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 in dwellings. Is, I mean, coming back to what Amelia said, is this opening the floodgates for the hinterland and could potentially now, with the, with, if this is approved, then, I mean, it does, does it open that precedent and we could then see more problems in the hinterland. So we're now, I mean, if, if this opens the floodgates, we, we have that potential problems that the hinterland face and what our coastal towns are facing now, is that correct? Well, this application has been approved for the use of this premise for short-term accommodation. We're obviously now talking about the increase of the number of people from eight to 10, and we're talking about issues around the driveway. Mm -hmm. So um, at the moment, the scheme, as I said, it doesn't have those provisions around predominantly mm -hmm. permanent residential. So if everyone in the hinterland obviously yeah. was of the mind to do it, then yes, it, 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 it would become an issue. Mm -hmm. um, but there are provisions within the scheme that also encourage cabins and short-term accommodation to facilitate more tourism and more economic development mm -hmm. within the rural areas as well. So um, certainly there is a need for it to, to um, facilitate that demand, um, but in terms of how far it goes, again, that might be something we need to look at through the planning scheme. Is that known at this stage though, isn't it? Well, how, how broad scale it could become, that's correct. Yeah, I did say, so, um, uh, Patrick just clarified, we, we are only looking at representations of the committee of the existing approval. <coughs> um, when we assess development applications, we must put our statutory hat on with our policy hat. With our statutory hat on, we have taken advice of our favours as to the level of compliance with the planning scheme performance outcomes, etc. And I think the logic they provided to us in the report uh, justifies their recommendation. In terms of the way ahead, um, councils, we have already adopted the housing strategy and the housing strategy has already indicated our policy is to make short stay accommodation in the rural residential zone consistent. So it won't lead to a uh, flood anymore and we are going to be looking at those scheme amendments in the coming weeks. Mm -hmm. So we've already made the policy decision that we do think we should tighten down on uh, short stay. And, but at this stage, the scheme was written at the time where we, are, we were encouraging uh, to spread the load of tourism and to take advantage of our natural assets in the hinterland. We're still going to do that, but we're just saying if you want to build in terms uh, accommodation on your property, it's done as part of a home host arrangement where you're living on there and having a cabin or two or whatever. So we are in this period between making a decision to change our policy approach and getting and receiving applications which we must by law consider against the scheme requirements as they now sit. And the key difference here between 
this site and the sites in medium density and high density residential is, as Patrick pointed out, uh, there is no uh, home that requires the, the use to be uh, predominantly residential in nature and even if it was the very low numbers of, of short stay accommodation in the rural residential zone means that this uh, that, that particular criteria we have in those two zones would, would not be triggered by this application. Now, I do know there are some suggesting uh, differently on social media, but I wouldn't suggest we listen to social media too much on that. Tom? Go, let's go back. So it says here, I, I assume that we had voted on this and that they do have mm -hmm. a, a do. rightful use as a short term accommodation. Yes. It says here the report for application was presented to council at the general meeting. Was it? Did it go through the so ordinary meeting vote? So it, the application was originally approved through the ordinary meeting vote, and then they came back and made representations. And Jada wrote a report and presented that to council. And through the presentation of that report, a number of issues were raised, including some by yourself around car parking. So it was deferred. The decision was deferred. Jada negotiated with the applicant to extend the decision-making period. It met the applicant on site, and now we're finalising the representations component. So, so we this didn't go through the ordinary meeting yet. We have not actually given this through an ordinary meeting vote. We have not given this STA approval. We have. We gave the STA approval condition. with conditions um, back in August of 2022. Yes. Okay. And then after that they made an application for representations to some of the conditions. Yeah. That came to council, wasn't resolved at council. It's now come back to council to resolve. Okay, groovy. That's what I thought happened. Yeah. I just, I got totally thrown by that. So I, I don't need to make my um, uh, long, my long speech here. So you're going to miss out, everybody. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, I guess, I will, as, as, as Amelia and the mayor have said, you know, have we learned nothing? Are we just taking what's, what, what went wrong over there and bringing it out to the hinterland? And I think we are because, but that's, that's not an issue right now. We're just looking at um, these particular points. And um, so, yeah, I, I actually support. It's, what, it's hard to, but... Well, look, I'm speaking in favour of the, the motion. I think the staff recommended the right, right approach to these representations to conditions. It is right that um, outdoor use, use of the outdoor area should be restricted um, to 9pm at the latest. Uh, it is right that the, um, the driveway be sealed so as to minimise the impact of dust on neighbouring properties and noise, I'd imagine. Uh, uh, it is right that um, the people that own the property are, are able to use the, uh, the outdoor areas after 9pm, like uh, annuals can in their own homes. And um, I, uh, as it, it, it is going to be subject to the uh, short-term accommodation local law, so the negative impacts that were on neighbourhoods or party houses, that's, um, that's not really an issue, or if, if it does be on the occasion that that does occur, there will be phone calls made and action taken. Um, and the um, accommodation of 10 in a house of that size, four bedrooms, is reasonable, and the SDA local law will manage any negative uh, impact should that occur. And as has also been said, this is um, an entirely consistent use to this property under the planning scheme as it stands. And if we don't like that use in the rural residential zone, we have the option of changing the planning scheme through amendments, which um, is something that may very well happen. So I'm in favour of this motion. Now the councillors proceed to the motion. Last, last question. Christian Thomas. It's great. So if, if, if we vote to not support the, this motion, it'll, go, it'll just go back to the original um, uh, specifications, the original um, one of the, the conditions. Original, yeah, the original, just, go, just revert back to the original conditions. That's correct. The original conditions um, didn't actually specify exactly how much of the driveway had to be sealed, but now it is specified. Is that right? That's, that's right. Yeah. So it is it. It, it, that that's a it's a 34 meters uh, up the road is to going to where where it's dirt right now so that this is a business 
and they probably should have a seal go to that. Go, it's all going to be sealed from Sunrise Rose all the way in. That's that correct? That's correct. The 30 more, 34 metres, I think, consists of 13 metres within the road reserve and 21 metres within the property. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Stockwell, you should close. Yeah, I, I will. Um, I think, yeah, we all know that the, <coughs> the, the online booking platform has created really problematic social tension in our community. And I'm not, in my comments about uh, social media, I'm not, not downplaying those concerns, but I am saying so. I believe um, my position on this development has been misrepresented in, in social media. Um, the, the clear fact is that the Planning Act defines short-term accommodation and, and defines party acts. Unfortunately, uh, for regulation, just holding parties in short-term accommodation doesn't constitute a party house. You have to advertise it, say, come here, be a Bucks party, come here, and actually have organised events. Uh, so the, the hurdle to get to a, to a party house definition under the Act is quite high. They are prohibited. You know, we, they're inconsistent everywhere in our shire, but to get to, to go from a short-stay short accommodation, which regularly has large groups who party when they're there, uh, to meeting that definition is where um, we would need legislative reform if we, if we wanted to really crack down on this. And I think it is something we may consider to make representations to the government on um, in terms of can that party house definition be broadened. Uh, but as, as it stands, um, that whole day families coming up, uh, staying in a house in rural residential development, maybe bring their mountain bikes to go to the nearby trails is quite an acceptable form of um, use of this site. The motion those in favour. Councillor Finzel, Stockwell, Jurisidic, Wilkie against. Wegener, Lawrence and Stewart. The motion's carried. Thank you, Yard. Next item five, such on the case and this original climate action roadmap. Cheyenne. Hello, councillors. Hi. Happy New Year. How is everyone? <laughs> Thank you for having me. Quick overview? Yes, please. Yes, okay. So this report is a summary uh, on the completion of a collaborative project with Sunshine Coast Council on the Regional Climate Action Roadmap. This was a pilot project of phase one of LGAQ and Department of Environment and Science Climate Risk Management Framework for Local Governments. We were chosen as one of two areas within the state to pilot this new climate risk management framework, which is good. It shows we're a leader in this space. Um, and now we finished this one year project with Sunshine Coast Council. Um, the benefits have been vast for both us and our community. I've listed them in the report and can go into further detail if needed. But this project included internal and community surveys, governance assessment, scenario workshops with both internal and external stakeholders, a community stakeholder map, and development of the project website and the Regional Climate Action Roadmap. This roadmap is significant because it outlines our commitment to collaborate at the regional level with Sunshine Coast Council, our community, key sectors and stakeholders and other levels of government to build a shared vision of a climate ready region. The roadmap outlines three strategic priorities, which you guys can see that are at the back of the report. The first is building climate ready councils, recognizing that we must first get our own house in order in order to be able to continue to provide essential services to our community, particularly given the amount of disruptions and disasters that are increasing in frequency and intensity. The second strategic priority is empowering climate ready communities, recognizing that council can and should play an important leadership role um, in helping our communities address their climate risks uh, through emissions reduction and climate change adaptation. The third strategic area or strategic priority is advocating for a climate ready region, recognizing that the depth and the breadth of climate change is so vast and it affects everyone in and everything in our society. It means that council cannot address this problem on its own. We need to build partnerships and we need to recognize that it's a shared responsibility that necessitates that collaborative approach, advocating to the right levels of government and society um, for assistance, funding, resources, and participation in this uh, common goal. 
So the next steps are for us to, um, where we, we've applied for a grant through Queensland Reconstruction Authority, which you all um, may have heard about. It's a cascading risks due to critical infrastructure failure project. So uh, one of the outcomes of this uh, one year project was that we recognize that when our critical infrastructure, such as water, power, transport, um, and telecommunications fail, there are cascading risks to society and impacts to society. And we want to look at those risks in more detail together with Sunshine Coast Council. So we're awaiting the outcome of the grant from the Queensland Reconstruction Authority. I've heard recently that it, it could be quite positive, so that's good. Um, another one is investigating regional heat risks together with Sunshine Coast Council. Heat hazard is one that we have not yet gone into detail yet. Um, it's not covered in the state planning policy in detail, and so we don't have very good understanding of our regional heat risks um, and also adaptation actions towards it. But that is something that we would like to investigate further this year. Um, we'll continue to engage with indigenous groups, so the Jinnabara and the Kabi Kabi at a regional level, and the Regional Youth Climate Leadership Group, which was established during this Regional Climate Action Roadmap Project. We'll engage with LGAQ and other stakeholders to, to seek further funding for phase two and phase three of the climate risk um, framework. Um, and one of the bigger items is we'll hopefully um, develop an embedding program to improve internal capability and capacity to address climate risks um, within council and for our communities. Sorry, that was a very long overview. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. Any questions for Shane and Judge? I on page 49 of the report there is some the graphs here, I think I wanted to get to with regards to the total disaster losses from the 1970s, 2019 and billions versus, in figure two, the cost of weather related disasters in Australia in billions. Are the cost, do the costs incorporate the losses? Yes, they do. Because, to my understanding, yeah, they do. I, I, yes. So it was interesting to look at the figures there uh, in that respect. Then. So there's a difference of $22 billion over those 50 years, which is uh, $44 million a year in additional weather-related disaster costs over the disaster losses. Just an interesting statistic that I dragged drag out of that. So. That is a good uh, insight. Thank you for sharing that. And good to person. clarify, it, it comes from Climate Council and they, they normally use the insurance council, so it's actually the, the, the losses as recorded by insurance claims, so it's likely to be lost. Yeah. But, but the losses the losses come to 90, uh, 70.98 million in losses, but the costs actually come to 90, over 93 billion. So now so I can't. I'm, I'm, I'm incorporating the losses, are still, you know, yeah. you, you, you need a lot more money to overcome the losses. Mm. Shay, I have a question for you. Yes. Yeah, it's on the last uh, paragraph in the report, in the internal consultation, if I can read this. Sentence, it's, it's a long one, I don't think there are many people stopping it. The Northern Constitutional Leadership Workshop sent staff and executives were specifically asked to reflect on and identify whether they have appropriate knowledge to make climate risk management decisions to address the identified risks, whether the risk is under their control to manage, and whether they have appropriate capacity, <laughs> capability, and supporting organisational structures, culture, policies, procedures, and processes to allow them to identify and manage the risk. So, my question is do they have the capacity? to manage the risks after that reflective process what was revealed um i can tell you my understanding but the directors that are in the room and scott might be able to reflect um better than i can my understanding coming away from that was we need a lot more work in this space we do need support we need to increase our resources and capability um, to address climate risks um, would you say well, perhaps <laughs> the most glaring risk that we haven't got covered is I think the critical infrastructure failure, the risk of critical infrastructure failure and cascading and compounding impacts on community and council is really important. And that's why we um, applied for a grant through Queensland Reconstruction Authority to advance that work as soon as possible. Now, just to put it in simple language, could you explain what cascading infrastructure failure means? That's yeah, so, well, when infrastructure fails, let's say there's a flood and a road cannot be traversed or let's say the power grid goes out yeah black mountain yeah perfect 
Um, so that's critical infrastructure failing or telecommunications going out. Cascading risks is when um, one risk interacts with another risks to create a snowball effect of interaction. So it just perpetuates further risks from occurring, basically, so or that impacts. That's a perfect yeah. example because yeah. of the traffic risks that are associated with people having to travel on a dirt road mm -hmm. along a detour, exactly. for example. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So Good analogy. global risk report um, from the World Economic Forum, mm. they use a term, I'm trying to think of the term, is it polycrisis or something like that? <laughs> yeah. Is that the same thing, Shania? Um, it is very similar, yeah. It's referring to, because risks can cascade, they can compound, and they can aggregate. So it's sort of looking at that from a... Sorry to interrupt. Oh. Are you filming this? No. Oh. He's got blue tag on his cameras. And so, yeah, polycrisis is referring to, yeah, it's referring to the aggregate of all that, particularly aggregate risks. For example, COVID-19 restrictions at the same time as the flood yeah. event. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, it, this is risk management. It does not use simple language. I apologize. Yeah, just for the benefit of people watching. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. I'm just going to follow on from your question about the paragraph first up as a sentence. Um, <laughs> <laughs> apologies. The, you, you did mention it's, it's around about our governance. Now, the LGAQ quite a few years ago brought out the consultant. I forget what his consultant name. I think Dorian Donovan. Yeah, Donovan. 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 Yeah, Donovan. Um, he did an assessment and it identified where we could improve and how we were working on. Okay. Did we redo that assessment as part of this project and track where we are? Because at that stage we were sort of getting close to the, to as good as anyone. But um, what I'm saying is, have we have we kept up our progress in terms of doing the right things in terms of having organisational governance reflect the risks, or is are we falling behind the pack? So yes, as part of this project, we did do another governance assessment using a, the same methodology, but we amended it a little bit to improve it. Yes, we have improved as an organization in terms of climate risk management across our policies, plans, and procedures. We have further detailed risk assessment work to do, though, to fully understand where we're at. Yeah. So it may have been mentioned before that, that the global risks reports just been circulated. And mm. It lists um, behind cost of living crisis in the two year horizon, natural disasters and extreme weather events, or failure to mitigate climate change. Uh, and the 10 year horizon, number one priority is failure to mitigate climate change, and two, failure of climate change adaptation. Yeah, yeah those so two go hand in hand mitigation and adaptation. Yeah. yeah. Um, I had another question there. Earlier in the report, you mentioned there was uh, this collaboration provides opportunities for council to work together um, uh, for better outcomes. Can you just give us an example of one of the projects that you're jointly collaborating on that will have real outcomes? Together with Sunshine Coast Council? Yeah. So, uh, well, outside of the one that we've applied for grant funding from, um, we're looking at regional heat risks together. Um, we have a meeting with LGAQ um, to advance the advocacy in that space, possibly a motion um, for the next LGAQ conference, a joint motion again. But um, other projects that we're working on is, well, we continue to advance our engagement with the regional uh, youth climate leadership group and the indigenous community. Um, but specific projects other than that, um, we're still identifying. The heat risk one, does that, yeah. you, uh, you mentioned something about putting, and it involves measuring the temperatures, getting a, a baseline for temperatures across the Shire, for example, at various locations. Yeah, looking at it. And then seeing how tree plantings can affect that. Correct, urban greening, yeah, so. Yeah, the real outcomes on the ground. Yeah. Help this work. Yes, definitely. That's, yes, definitely, yes. Um, that's our intention. And yeah, we're looking at uh, uh, using satellites for regional heat distribution. So where are our hottest urban areas across the region? Yeah. I'll, I'll move the recommendation. Um, I, I support this report. Um, I think that page 48 really sums up everything where it says uh, analysis of the Insurance Council of Australia 
The Productivity Commission and yeah. Deloitte show that for every dollar invested in resilience measure, measures that better protected communities from extreme weather, $10 are returned in avoided damage and recovery costs. So it's a, you know, it's a 10 to 1 um, uh, advantage here to spend on this. Now, and I look at uh, some things like um, the emergency dashboard mm. uh, that, that we have, and that could be something we work, could work with the Sunshine Coast Council on, because that is, that, that's it, you know, but that mm. helps us so much. Um, Cross-council co coordination, and along with Gimpy as well. And second, um, I was really taken with Elaine Bradley, who with the um, Mary River Growers, mm. with the phone tree. So during the uh, beginning of the pandemic, so many people there are elderly and they'd go to the Pomona markets to buy their food. Well, they realized that they didn't want to go to the Pomona markets anymore, so they, they didn't know how to, how to get their food. So they quickly set up a phone tree so that everybody had to call five other people. And these five people had to call another five people to make sure that everybody in the entire network was, was called every week. And so that was their like, micro response to climate mm -hmm. change. And um, listening to them, I think that, that's just a fantastic way. To me, that, that is you know, an example of grassroots up resiliency. And so I've noted in, in the report, it says you know, you're starting at council, but you're also really looking at um, supporting the community groups. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing is just to listen to the community groups and see how they're actually acting and then really supporting those community groups in their grassroots attempts at <coughs> maintaining communication amongst us. Because really the, the communication side, the dashboard, these phone trees, these other ways that people communicate from council down, but also amongst the community themselves is super, super, super important. Completely agree, Councillor. Yeah, thank you. One of uh, the RS, RFS um, leaders in our region told me the best resilience is self-resilience, and mm -hmm. that's a great example of community resilience right there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll speak. I'm um, I'll speak to the motion right on there. Hi. Um, my question is, um, are we doing it enough? Um, <laughs> are we, as a region, drought-proof? Are we as a region flood proof? Are we as a region fire proof? And are we running out of time? Um, we need significant policy changes. We need significant investment. And we need commitment from our leaders and our community. This roadmap must progress quickly because time is not on our side. The key warning from the World Economic Forum's latest global risk reports identify, as Frank mentioned before, the three risk as being the cost of living crisis, natural disasters, and extreme weather as the top risk over the next two years. Mm. Um, the triple anemia, it's over. We're about to enter a seven, eight year drought period. Mm. There is going to be more frequent and severe weather events like flooding, like droughts, like heat waves and storms that will impact, as we've already witnessed, our regional economy, as well as human health and safety, and our environment. Um, we as leaders, we've got a duty of care to act, because doing nothing is not an option. Doing nothing, in fact, is a liability. Um, I want to thank Cheyenne Sunshine Coast Council um, for the work to date. Um, totally agree together we're stronger. And I also love to encourage Cheyenne, I had a look at the video that the Sunshine Coast have um, posted on this collaboration. Mm -hmm. It would be great to share it on our socials because it really captures the impact of heat waves, even with our volunteers, yeah. our volunteers who are there to mitigate the impacts of climate change, mm -hmm. our bush care um, volunteers, um, and how heat waves impact those numbers. Yeah. So we're going to lose volunteers. Like this is something on a people, business, and environment level that um, is huge. Um, so thanks for the work today. Let's get it happening. Um, planning's done. We know the risk. Let's just do it. Thank you, Councillor. I couldn't agree more. Jane, <laughs> thank you for all your work, and, and you know, it's great to see that we're collaborating with our neighbouring councils. It's, it's important. Um, yeah, you know, climate change and natural disasters, they don't have boundaries. We saw that with the Coast Guard disaster on the eastern beaches um, in the flood, February flood event last year. So when we have those natural disasters, we do rely on each other uh, for support, and also the impact is, is on everyone's infrastructure and natural assets. So I think this roadmap is a really important piece of work and I uh, thank you and commend you on, on it. Thank you, Mary. It was also Rebecca and the rest of the climate team, climate change team. <laughs> Annie and Sally had a big role as well. 
Um, and yes, we'll do a joint media release in the next month. That's what we're aiming for. Yes. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank oh, you. sorry. Um, yeah, I will, I will talk. It's, it's an interesting um, test case in that we haven't done many regional projects since the amalgamation. Mm -hmm. um, but the argument always was that, that when a <coughs> problem or an issue is one that's best dealt with at the regional level, that Lisa and and sunny coast would work together and this is a good example that this is obviously a problem where the local scale uh, you can have very intensive programs but your impacts are better the, the larger scale and the risks that are associated with climate change are no different between our two mm -hmm. councils um, you know there is a range of risks and i actually had a quick look and i thought the picture on page 62 told a story a very nice picture um i think i might take it um, <laughs> it was at a, a, a scout camp, uh, sunrise, we were teaching young children how to sail. Well, that probably has occurred for most of this history, probably without sales for the our First Nations people. And why we have to look at this risk is we want people in a hundred years' time to have the same river, the same recreation. We don't want them having to be pulling them off uh, for three hours during the middle of the day because it's too hot and too dangerous to be out there. We want the local businesses that to continue to benefit from having sailing like the Dabra. And we want to make sure that um, our campground, you know, Council Campground, uh, isn't continually drawing money because of the excessive flooding that's occurring on a more regular basis as a result of climate change. So these are all these big picture risks and it's so easy to put them off. And the Saturday lesson I learned was I think last year when LGAQ presented the last global risk report which clearly has climate change high. And then they did uh, gave us results of a survey of uh, CEOs, I think it was across Australia, maybe just Queensland, and climate change didn't make it mm -hmm. to their risk register in terms of what's most uh, serious risk at local government bases. That's where the capacity building is required. It's not just a, how we design infrastructure, it's about realising at every level of the organisation that this is probably the biggest risk that will have to address within our working careers. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. We have a council to speak for motion before Tom closes. Tom, you're just closed. Yes, please. Um, one uh, concept of a cascading effect that, mm. that I worry about, everybody knows that I worry about food and, and agriculture here, but that is, you know, an example where there's a drought, where the drought does come through, as it eventually will, and all of a sudden we have, a, you know, but limited food here, and as, um, as uh, the chain, as our supply chains collapse around us, and we go into that mode of, of panic, which, we, which is foreseeable, well, we... Um, with there's things we can do now, and if you know, just using that as an example because I'm so passionate about that. But um, I think that a, a part of it, and its suggestion is really focusing on connecting the dots from the big picture risks to the individual. Mm -hmm. What you know, what's going to come. What can you do today? Mm -hmm. What can you do to vote with your money, to vote with your feet, to to, to make things better for ourselves? And I think that's something that. Um, well, the, the connection between councils and, and the big ideas and community groups really needs to focus on. So I, su I suggest really working on that, the community side of, um, of that, the roadmap. Yeah, we need, we, did, we need to connect, connect the dots from the big picture to our individual actions. Mm. And I think that that's a focus. That's going to be a focus for me this year. I so, agree. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for you as well. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, councillors. Thank you. Nice to see you. Have a good day. We've got our acting uh, financial services manager, Pauline Coles, and um, Trent, the uh, um, acting corporate services director. The acting. Is that a breakfast? A breakfast. A breakfast. Yes. But Pauline, are you giving us the overview first? I am. Yes. yes. Good afternoon, councillors. We are halfway through the financial uh, financial year. And financial performance continues to be strong with operating revenues outperforming our forecast. Our operating expenditures are slightly under forecast year to date, however. Operating revenue is $2.9 million over budget, and this is driven by $421,000 from general rates and waste charges, $292,000 from fees and charges. Interest income is $1.4 million over budget, however, this is likely to be closer to $2 million by the end of the year due to the investment in high yielding term deposits. 
Sales of goods and services are 700,000 over budget, which is predominantly from holiday park revenue and waste disposal fees. And operating grant revenue is $400,000 over budget. Operating expenditure is $52,000 under budget, with materials and services $596,000 over, and being offset by lower than budgeted employee costs of $670,000. Tourism, tourism and economic development expenditure remains on track here today, which is good. Uh, again, we've included a quarterly legal fees update, which shows that legal fees are tracking below budget year to date. However, it should be noted that the timing of legal fees is dependent on the timing of development appeals and other legal matters that are being dealt with by council. Um, overall, council's operating position at December is $3.4 million above budget. However, there's a couple of things I'd like to bring to your attention. It should be noted that um, this, impact, this position may be impacted by the increased employee costs that may result when we get the December quarter CPI. Our current budget includes provision for a 5% CPI increase, however we expect that it will be closer to 7 to 8%. And that will quantify as about another five hundred to $600,000 to the bottom line. <laughs> the other thing to note is in relation to the financial assistance grants, we have been notified that Noosa will receive a reduced amount of financial assistance grant and last year, we re well this year we received 6% less than the prior year. We also received 75% up front last year of our financial assistance grant, whereas we normally would receive 50%, sorry. That could impact us to between five hundred to $700,000 this financial year, but we won't know that till we get closer to the end of the financial year. Um, capital revenue is above budget $11 million, again due largely to the advance payment of the Cure Rate Disaster Funding, and capital expenditure is showing $4.7 million behind budget year to date. However, there are several projects that have cost overruns which are being masked by budget and timing um, on other projects. Council's current cash holding at the end of December was $95 million, with $55 million of these funds currently invested in term deposits. And as requested at the November meeting, we have included a quarterly dissection of Council's cash holding, which breaks down those segments of what makes up that $95 million. Um, we've also included in this month's report uh, some information on the transit rating categories and short-stay local laws. And I'll leave it there and I'll wait for your questions. <laughs> Yeah, so we have several projects that are running over budget that are offset by some um, budget profile and timing of other projects in the program. Okay, so, so basically for accounting purposes, that's, that's where it's coming in. It's not correct, so correct. So it's more yeah. the fact that I'm just simply highlighting that there are several projects that are running over budget, but it's not showing through that, that consolidated line item just to highlight it to you. Okay, and the $55 million that we've got um, in terms of deposits, yep. um, which um, banks, I know that they're across a number that yep, invested so in? Yep, so we QGC. currently hold term deposits with Commonwealth Bank, Westpac and National Australia Bank. And QTC. Uh, QTC is not technically a term deposit, but yes, we invest funds with them. Okay. Um, strong cash expense cover as always, but this potentially, I mean, this is very much above the norm, isn't it? Well, the average. Correct. So if you were to look at the dissection that we've provided, um, because of the way that the cash cover is calculated, it's calculated on the whole cash balance. So it escalates, it, it sort of exacerbates our monthly cash cover. Yeah. Um, but if you look at the dissection, that's showing you... On page 71, councillors. Yeah. yeah. So um, what Pauline's alluding to is that <laughs> our cash cover um, ratio is quite high, yeah. but we've received, and you'll see that with the allocation of cash balances, where we receive grants in advance, it could be money in advance for the Black Mountain uh, remediation capital right. works or the waste levy in advance. Um, that's restricted cash. Yeah. So whilst we have a cash cover balance, um, the vast majority of our cash balances are restricted for a specific purpose. Um, and that's what, we're, that's what yeah. we're presenting there in the report to demonstrate that whilst there is $95 billion in the bank, um, you'll notice that the vast majority of that is restricted or committed yeah. for, a, for earmarked for a specific purpose. Yeah. And what's left in terms of free cash and working capital and uh, is under $10 million. Correct. And will be depleted as, as the month. As the projects yeah. are delivered or we use those funds. Can I just follow up on that one? Because the dot point is straight above figure seven. I just want to clarify too, it's gone down you say from 12, so it's gone down to 7 million. Correct. That's both through the budgeted works plus overruns. That's not $7 million worth of overruns. No, 
Correct. So that's so um, of our total cash balance, we have we obviously have an amount that we can fund through revenue each year. Yep. Um, through us um, committing through the budget process for a higher capital works program, um, we are eroding into that long term surplus cash. Um, and the more that we commit through project variations, the more that that erodes during the year. Um, the only thing that tops that up in the long term is is surpluses or, or low capital works programs. Yeah. I'll just add to that point there, the point raised a couple of points a year above that is the $22 million in committed capital works comprising $12 million current year projects, $6 million future year projects and $4 million in project variations. I'm assuming those $4 million in project variations are part of that impact there. Yeah. Correct. Correct. And you'll, and you'll see those come through budget review too, um, which will come through the March or April round of council meetings. So this question, I hear the answer. I don't think you're completely right, Joe. I think that's another four million of variations that haven't already been spent. It's already been spent. The ones that have already been spent are in the bottom. So, so, the, so the seven million, the decrease in the un, yeah. un, unrestricted is four million dollars worth of capital so project yeah, variations. The, the other part is actually relating to the fact that we're in December, so we actually have to fund January before we get our rates. So we actually allow some funding for that month to cover the cost of operations. That's okay. why it's decreased in December as well. So that takes up takes you up to the seven million. 61. I know what you're going to ask. Thank you for that's um, I requested information on the transitory rating just so that we have an understanding how much money is actually being collected um, in short-term um, accommodation. Um, really detailed and really great. Thank you guys. I know that took a lot of effort. Can I explain to you how I've read this and can you come back to me and say whether I'm right or wrong? Sure. Um, so I'm going to really try to simplify what, what's been written, but my understanding is that we've got 31,000, just over 31,000 uh, 31, properties um, in the Shire, um, and the unimproved land value of those properties equals just over $13 billion. Um, transitory properties, we have 4,376. The sum of their land valuation and improved value is just over 1.5 billion. So transitory accommodation is generating in terms of general rates, $15.2 million, of which 2.78 million we take out to pay tourism visa. Right. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Just to clarify, tourism, NOSA, and economic development, yeah. and LEP implementation. So, correct. So, that resists that. Absolutely. The old tourism yeah. levy. Tourism and economic levy. So, in terms of sh our um, short stay letting and local law, um, the cost of that is in this chart. With, um, We've generated to date 45,000, but it's cost 220, just over 220,000. So there's a net shortfall of 173,000. Year to date, yes. Um, which we're taking out of the 15.2 million that's been generated from rates from transitory rate? No. no. Okay, that's, um, that's where I'm confused. So, so through the chair to clarify, um, that's been funded through general rate. Mm -hmm. So as such, um, anything, any activity, whether that's the short stay local law, um, funding shortfall, roads, libraries, um, any of our broad sector activities, it's funded generally. So it's 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 okay. gathered from not just the short stay, but um, residential, non-PPR residential, commercial and industrial, agricultural properties. It's it's a, it's, it's not um, targeted to a particular category of land use. It's funded across the board. So you're seeing that at the table of the last table at the bottom of page 72, where the shortfall is split um, based on based on revenue and valuation mix. Okay. Um, so that's where it actually is. There's probably more of that shortfall funding coming out of residential, okay. PPR and non-PPR, yeah. um, than there is out of other land uses because it's a, gen it's 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 a general fund. So my question is, if we were to reinstate, say, the tourism economic levy, would that provide more clarity as to where the funds are being spent? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think 
through the chair, I think the the, the primary the primary question that needs to be um, addressed for council through the budget process is more about the application of short stay local law um, fees and charges processes. Um, mm -hmm which you will obviously address in the coming months through future rounds of council so meetings. That's, that's to have a discussion. Yes. Correct. And what the full cost is moving forward as we, we come through implementation into steady state operation mm -hmm. mode as well, because the resourcing impact, as you'll see through future discussions, is higher on implementation of something like a local law in the first year yep. than it will be long term as we operate that. As to clarify, I actually think the table on page 72 is contrary to process. You, you've made assumptions and hypotheticals to say if we were to split the cost across the, the revenue sources, but general revenue is general revenue. Correct. You don't Correct. need to say these Correct. people pay for it. I think that's actually a, a really cumbersome and pro problematic approach. I think you've actually done something that's incorrect. Because no one's made a decision where the money comes from. What you're saying, if it was apportioned equally from the source of the revenue, then this is what it looks like. Uh, through the Chair, in terms of the tourism and economic development uh, levy application, um, we have the workings backward from the unwinding of the TEL back to the rating category. Yeah, yeah, we I were understand. To unwind that. In terms of the short stay, um, like any activity, it's a general rating pool. So all we can do in any instance is to say, this is the general rating mix. We don't yeah. break it that, down. I'm quite happy if, if, it like, is not if possible you would have made a statement down. like that, I was quite happy. But yeah. the table, I no, think, no, misrepresents. No, it's questions. OK. okay. So, the, so the next question. In debate, if you want to make a good point. I do apologise. I was debating. Um, so the next question is, it, uh, another way to look at it is that when you compared a short stay accommodation premises with a residential premises next door that doesn't have that pride, mm -hmm. there is a different rate in the dollar. Correct. And would the premium that's charged be sufficient to pay for the total tourism and economic um, contribution plus out of the scheme? Would that extra premium be in excess of the two point X million dollars? I'll make a comment in terms of that. I think that the difference in your transitive rating categories above a residential <coughs> is not just to reflect tourism and economic activity oh, yeah, I as well. That, yeah. So yeah, it's it's actually going to be like if you look at I think it's the table on page about 70, seventy three. Yeah. Yeah. You'll see that transitory rating on the average general rate per property is two uh, two thousand eight hundred, which is closer to commercial, which was I think the original intent of yeah, why the transitory yeah, categories yeah, were bought in. Right. So it's not just tourism and yeah, that yeah, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, to achieve all, what Rise is going to achieve, you have to take those 2,000. How many, how many properties were there? Yeah. Sorry, I'm oh, yeah. sorry. Four four compare four. what they would pay if they were yeah. PPR versus non PPR, and then actually do a, do a tally to come up with a, with a total figure of what's that. 1,200 mm -hmm. difference between PPR, T, yeah, right. um, and and transitory, so multiply that by 4,376 and I think it will generate more than the, the tourism and economic levy. Yeah, but I get what you're saying, that's more accurate a number than the 15.2. Yeah. I have a question about the number of transitory accommodation properties, you've got 4,376 and the housing, um, for, uh, the housing strategy that we recently approved, uh, sorry, the short-term monitoring report that we recently approved. You mentioned the figure of 5,265. Could you put that discrepancy in perspective, please? Sure, through the chair. Um, so you have um, what is currently rated. So what you're seeing in front of you is, per our rating system, what is currently rated. Um, what you will see through our any updates or reports through our short stay and accommodation letting mm. team is information on the current number of assessed or identified um, properties that fall under the local law. Not all of those have followed through the application, submission and assessment process to then be levied accordingly. So long term, once we get through that process, um, you, you will have alignment between the two. Is that under the local law or currently under the rating structure that are rated in that fashion? Because not all of those under the local law have been registered as yet. Correct, that's, that's right. That's why there's a difference, Jim. Which is why you'll see that revenue discrepancy in that yeah, other that's, table. That's they're not so what we've got there is those that we know and we're rating accordingly. Correct. Right. Yeah, different subject. Um, you mentioned that we've been advised that our federal assistance grants likely to go down. Can you explain, is that a result of 
a change in policy stress formula to how it's distributed, or is it a, a result of the previous payments or something else? No, it's a rate in relation to the, the department's methodology in terms of determining how much is allocated to each council. And because of NUSA generally is quite financially sustainable and uh, financially sound, our allocation, or the assets that we look after as well as a lot, lot less than some of the more regional areas, our allocation has gone down. Yeah. Just just to add through the chair, I think it was this time last year the state commenced a methodology review, mm -hmm. um, yeah. which right. which changed the outcome of that um, grant allocation to different yeah. regions. So um, whilst we have received a decrease, some other areas. areas like some of our neighbours may have received an increase. And in percentage terms, that decrease. Quite so quite we were advised we could expect a fourteen percent increase. We actually got a six point three percent decrease. So we, we, we got to, we were advised you know, through a letter that we would get fourteen percent. The actual rate decrease was about six percent. And no just wow. explanation to that reason. It, well, it's dependent on how much the federal government allocates to financial assistance grants, and so that sort of flows through as well. So the pot might be larger to allocate, so that reduces our reduction when it gets allocated out as well. So that's twenty percent. Yes. Positive to 16. No, no. So it was. It was. We were advised it was going to be a fourteen percent decrease. Oh, decrease. We got a six percent. Oh, sorry, yes. my apologies. Six percent yeah. decrease. My apologies. Yeah. yeah. Got it, Joe. Um, yeah, I always look at these um, tables that we put together with category and summary and comments, uh, operating operating revenue and expenses. And one that just sprang out of me this uh, this month was waste management royalties. Thirty four points to carry over the year to date budget. Um, for those uh, online and from the council around the table, what are waste management royalties? Because it's not something that appears very often uh, as a line item anywhere, particularly a highlighted item anywhere, and why are they on the You can <laughs> Through the chair. Um, so uh, in the complex operations of our waste management program um, is included there. We have a contract in place um, for um, extraction and um, treatment of gas and so uh, we have an outsourced contractor and, gas, and, gas gas capture. Um, and so a part of that contract is obviously uh, there's a there's a contract payment back to council for the operation of that so from an accounting perspective we call it a royalty could be called a commission um, or a share of that for a share of that recovery uh, but what you're seeing there is that is that payment back to council for that, um, which is well always, above you. Do we always had a royalty from the from the date started, or is it? Yes, through the yeah. chair. Yes, so we have um, this year's higher than previous years. Um, there is a, an adjustment or a catch-up payment. Um, still working through because that just came through last month. Still working through the the quantum of how far that correction payment goes back for. But it's um it's it's not large as you see. The the variation year to date was was noted. The the additional length of lines and the additional work that we did in, in uh, enhancing the gas capture is that, that a, a factor in this? I'd have to take that on notice, Councillor. I'm, un I'm unsure what's driving it. That's why we're going to do some work to sort of just make sure we're, we're clear that, about that, what's that driving that. Is, has been the additional capture yeah, whether it's a correction or whether it's a result of improved process is what we're looking for. Thank you, Councillor. Do you saw you were the MD. Waste management royalty in this. <laughs> <laughs> Tom. Question. It, it could be that the royalty could be from the sale of 2,000 cubic metres of double grind as well. Uh, through the chair, no, it's, it's to do with, it's, it's purely to do with the, yeah, the methane gas. It's just purely gas, yeah. okay. I have some questions on um, page 66 um, expenditure. You mentioned civil operations of 479 over the year to date budget. I don't, is that a good thing or a bad thing? We're, we are doing further investigations and, and we're, we're looking at whether or not some of that actually related to, it's it predominantly relating to gravel roads um, and whether some of that uh, costing should have related to flood projects that yes. are funded by grants. So we're still Our in response. the process. Correct. Right. So yeah. we're, we're in the so process of funding elsewhere that's captured in this. Yeah. yeah. We're just, we're just and we're working hard. Pulling, pulling it apart now, we're pulling it apart now because it's, it's actually being accounted through our normal system. Whereas it actually should be accounted through the QRA. Um, right, the grants. Grants. Yeah, grants. yeah, so the money, the money's, yeah, sorry. So it's, so it's showing up in these books and it should be showing up in the, in the disaster management books. Okay. As such. Right. The insurance costs, 
50,000 over budget, is that due to disaster response as well? No, that's response? just an increase in the premiums based on the whole of like the so councils all contribute to the same general insurance premium. It's just the insurance premium increase, and we have historically had some larger claims, although it should peter off as time. So, so, so did council statewide? Correct. So um, just to clarify, so we through the budget process. Obviously, we're about to start our budget process for next year. Um, like all our cost increases and CPI. We make, an, uh, we make an assumption or an assessment on what we think our insurance premiums will increase by back in February, um, but we don't get notification of that until after the financial year has commenced. So um, it's increased higher than what we'd assumed it would. Um, and obviously a whole range of economic conditions are driving that broader insurance pool yeah. increase, as Pauline yeah. alludes to. Final question, um, page 78, the statement of financial position. Our um, total assets or total community equity from the end of 2022 is dropping from 1.3 million to 1.19, drop of 174 million in the value of the assets. There's been an asset re evaluation done. Is that, could you, could you just put that drop into context, please? What's, what's going on there? So, in terms of the forecast, are you sorry, just in yeah, the year end? So, from the end of 2022, assets. Total community equity 1.3 billion, dropping down to 1.19 billion. So the difference of this uh, forecast. Yeah, this is forecast. Why is there appreciation? Why are we so be predicting to lose 170 about 170 million? I'm I'm guessing that it would generally be around the re the revaluation of assets at the end of the year. Mm. We did the revaluation at June, and when we were doing budget forecasts, that was through the April May period. So the large most of that should be relating to the fact that we had revaluations coming through for land um, and plant. And you also find the cash balances forecast as at 30th of June in the statement in front of you. Cash is um, to 98 million mm. at the start of the year, we'll be down to 64 million by the end, and that's us using up all those. Mm. We talked yeah. about that restricted cash and, gr and grants mm. and levies and loan funds. So it's us working back through that um, that cash balance that we've been from cash in advance. So dropping cash, asset revaluations, um, there's some debt balances that are clearing out by end of year. But when well. you build new assets, doesn't that top that figure up? Uh, depends on on how much are new and how much is renewal. Yes, so every, every year that figure gets de, de, uh, gets reduced by the yeah. each year as well. Okay. So how's our depreciation going to be affected? I know that it's currently about nine point eight for half the year, nine point eight million. So expecting nineteen point six million in depreciation this year. Correct. Right. So we would expect from a revaluation, or the majority of last year's revaluation related to land, which doesn't have depreciation, that there would be an element of flow through for depreciation impact with the forecast. Yeah. The biggest challenge for this year, um, councillors, will be that we are undertaking our roads and bridges comprehensive um, valuation at present. It's our biggest class of asset. Mm -hmm. um, and it's probably the biggest in terms of um, materials, cost increases, in the in the industry over the last 12 to 18 months concrete bitumen asphalt um, steel for the bridges that's where we've seen the biggest price pressure so it, it'll be it's a it's a watch the space as we go through the valuation exercise over the next few months when was it last valued Trent? Um, when were those assets last valued years ago 2018 i think 2018. Yeah. and yeah. how that's that's five years ago yeah. How often is that, is that standard industry practice? So according to the accounting standards, it's up to, up to five years maximum. But what we do is every year we do what we call a desktop assessment. So we still look, so whilst we won't go through the entire asset base every year, we'll do that every five years. Every year in the intervening, we will just look at what the price indices do every year and adjust the whole asset base up, valuation up accordingly. So. Mm -hmm. it, so to keep our assets in good nick, that means we, we like to spend at least a day of depreciation in renewals. Correct. So Correct. that means we'll be spending more on uh, asset renewal Correct. this and, coming year. And that would be aligned to the fact that we're seeing price increases in our Capital Works program as well. Um, yes. you, the, two should, the two should flow in hand, hand. The higher the depreciation, the higher the value of your assets go up, mm. that level of increase should then reflect in what you invest in your renewal and your assets.
Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, the next question. So that would suggest that the valuation of assets is, is based on replacement value, is it? Or was it just that they say, well, at 100% of it, if it was built now and it was new, it would be this much and it's had seven years of depreciation, so it's that much? Is that? Combination of, of um, new replacement, but also um, based on current. Um, um, Legislative standards, like if you needed to bring it up to compliance and it wasn't, you'd need to adjust the value for that yep. as well. In current methodology, so you might not replace this type of bridge, mm. and you might not replace a timber bridge with, with a timber bridge, you might use a concrete bridge as a replacement. So when we would value a timber bridge, if the intent was we'd replace that at a end of life with the concrete, we would value it and depreciate it accordingly so that we generated sufficient funds to replace that in 80 years time. So we'll pump the line. Yeah. That's a good Correct. example. Yeah. Right. Yep. We also take into account condition. Yeah. So every five years when we do that exercise of the revaluation, whilst we might have a, a theoretical 80 year life on a bridge, um, we look at the actual condition of the bridge to understand whilst on paper it might have on average about an 80 year life, it might well be that it can last 120 or 70 given its condition is so close to the coastline and there's, there's salt intrusion, etc. Karen. Yes, um, thank you for the report. Given the conversation we've had around the table and the report on the climate change roadmap, where are we looking at um, mitigating the shortfalls and the impacts of the cash you know, holdings from the rebuilds on our infrastructure from you know, um, you know, floods and fire and all that? How are we going to mitigate that or where are we measuring or projecting those costs that have come back to us that we may not currently <coughs> how are we measuring that moving forward for that risk and that council is probably the, one of the biggest challenges we face with financial sustainability as mm -hmm. a local government is we can we build cash reserves aside for immediate disaster requirements so you'll see in our restricted cash we do keep a few million dollars aside for immediate recovery mm -hmm. that's for the element of work for, for example from last year's march 22 Flood recovery, there's an element that may not be covered by state. We fund that. But in terms of the broader issue of um, long-term um, intervention infrastructure um, and the cost of mitigating impacts, that's where the, the important focus on financial sustainability needs to be on the long-term. You look at your long-term financial planning and making sure you're identifying that need over a 10, 20, 50 year term so that we can start building funding mechanisms for that now. And that, that could be grant funding. The vast majority, I imagine, would be looking at grant funding for those opportunities. And, you know, second, probably last option would be borrowing to fund, which we ted, we don't we don't use as our first option generally. Yeah. Um, I'm going to backtrack a little bit, Pauline. Um, you identified two extra potential risk to that may impact cash flow and that was the increase to CPIs um, for 500, 600,000 impact. Yep, um, for this financial year. This yes. financial year and also the federal assistance grant Correct. of possibly another five, 600,000. Yep. Two questions, um, where are we going to get that money and will there be any changes made to budget spending to mitigate or absorb this loss. So one of the reasons it was highlighted is we're currently showing you a $3.4 million up, upside at this point in the year. Yeah. Um, two million of our revenue will be from interest and a large proportion of that uh, will go to fund those overruns that we expect to see. So it'll be offset by the interest upside, which will be about $2 million for the year. Okay. And in terms of CPI, um, what is the forecast? My understanding is peaking right now um, that it's not expected to go up higher. Is that the information you're getting, Pauline? Uh, we, we believe that December will most likely be at the height. It could be March, but it will start to decline after that. It will start to decline. But we're, we're all waiting for the 25th of January to see what December quarter is. Thank and you. while we've got you, can you give us an outline of the budget uh, consultation process that we're proposing? Sure. Um, you. Through, the, through the chair, we're kicking the budget off. There's no rest for budget time. It seems to roll around sooner than you realise. Um, so we are commencing the budget process over the next month. So we'll be starting, obviously, internally with yourselves in terms of agreeing the process next week at a workshop. Um, we will have a live stream um, 
on the key budget matters in March, um, which will obviously um, outline for yourselves and officers and for the broader public um, all key matters to take into account in the budget. We're aiming to have a draft budget together aligned with your priorities coming out of the new corporate plan in April. Um, and similar to previous years, we'll use the, the, the back fortnight of April and the first few weeks of May to engage the community again in terms of a consultation process. It will involve a mix of um, online survey, a face-to-face -face session, um, and obviously a workshop for the public who want to attend as well. So we'll do some refining on the on the process from last year in terms of the forums, but the general concept of trying to achieve achieve some reach through a couple of different mechanisms, we'll continue with that this year as well. Thank you again. We will hit these every month, and they're always um, very comprehensive. Um, and thank you for outlining the concerns and, and the reasons and you know, all, all of the, um, the questions that you have. Um, I'm, I'm really comfortable and at the table are uh, with all the explanations and the answers um, going forward. Uh, there are some, there'll be some hard decisions going into the budget. You talked about. You know, the, the increased cost of the resales and the renewals, so that potentially then impacts upon all that new budget initiatives. If, you know, um, so there will be some hard decisions to make, um, and we obviously want to keep our um, general rate and our rates as low as possible for our community. So thank you, um, because we'll be guided by this information over the next couple of months. I'll put it to the vote. All in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you, Pauline and Trent. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the gallery, we now have uh, some confidential matters that need to be discussed on the issue of the commercial and confidence nature of the discussions regarding an environmental matters and budget negotiations for the final one, probably for the Corporate and also um, the Office of Administration space. So, some people have heard that we're going to come to the session with Councillor Lawrence, Councillor Stewart, the second, and would you like to have a five minute conversation?
Uh, now you told it's Castle Lake is on you. Where is it? There, there's no right. Castle Lake. Wait, I've done it. Nick. Yeah. 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 Oh, there is Castle Lake, Lake Lake. Okay. Welcome back, everyone. The meeting is now we are open to the public. Uh, we have some confidential items. Um, we've got some motions that have come from that council of Jerusalem. I'd like to move item seven with an additional clause, item F, uh, to investigate the opportunity of providing a public space, re of providing a public recreational space on the cleared land. And Joe, perhaps would you, could you read it for the entire So the, the entire is motion is that council note the report by the principal environment officer to the general committee meeting dated 16th of January 2023 and authorise the CEO to a. Commence negotiations with the owners or their agent regarding the purchase of the property as detailed in the report. B. Seek an independent valuation of the property reflecting current market price. C. If purchased by council, place a nature refuge over the vegetated areas of the property. D. Undertake rehabilitation actions on the land including removal and or demolition of unapproved structures. E. Take the M down to the account and let's go on to the end of E. E, investigate resale of the property as a revolving fund following the example of the nature refuge and F, investigate the opportunity of providing a public recreational sp space on the cleared land. Second, Councillor Stewart. Uh, no discussion on no that? No discussion on that. All in favour? It's carried unanimously. Next item, please. Uh, this is the uh, contract for Nusa Parade Corridor Upgrade Final Budget Approval, Councillor Lawrence. Um, I, Councillor Lawrence, informed the meeting that I have declarable conflict of interest in this matter as I own the property on Nusa Parade. As a result of my conflict of interest, I will now leave the meeting room while the matter is considered and voted on. Councillor Lawrence. It would be also uh, appropriate to note at this stage that Councillor Lawrence left the meeting in committee. At the in confidential. In confidential session, um, as soon as you become aware of the conflict. In, in, in confidential session. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay, we have a move and a second, please. Uh, oh, I'm happy with that. Move Councillor Finzel, second to Councillor Jerusalem. No discussion? All in favour? It's carried unanimously. We have a procedural motion that the uh, item regarding office administration space, could kill one off, lay on the table for the ordinary meeting date of 19 January 2022. Great, right. Three, three. <laughs> I'm happy to move that. A second, Councillor Finzel. All in favour? That's carried. That's the last item for today. Thank you, Councillors, for your attendance. Thank you, Larry. Thank you.